Welcome to the Centre for Legal Innovation's Legal Techie Tuesday series. We are very excited to have Jean Turner and Hayden Sinclair with us today. Jean is the Managing Director of Law Hawk and Hayden is the Principal at the SharePoint Agency. They will be giving a demonstration of some of the functionality of Office 365 Tech, particularly as it relates to the legal industry. Again, welcome. Fabulous to have you here. And now over to Jean and Hayden. Thanks, Christine. Hi, everybody. Uh, so what we're going to try and do today is, is really give an introduction to um, Office 365 and, and SharePoint. So the things that we'll try and cover off is uh, what, what are they? Um, mainly we're going to focus on SharePoint. There's, um, there's a whole lot of things in the Office 365 suite, which we'll briefly point some of them out. But uh, for just with the length of the session, we're not going to be able to cover um, everything that, um, that we could. Um, we really want to focus on SharePoint and why it's so particularly relevant to, um, to lawyers and, and particularly in-house legal teams. Uh, we're going to look at some of the reasons why people might struggle with it or have struggled with it in the past and how you could avoid those. And then we want to show you some of the things that it can be used for. Uh, and we'll give you an example of um, a sort of more integrated workflow that we've built up as, a, as an example, and then we can do the questions. Uh, we're going to go pretty quickly because there is a lot of stuff that we could cover and we're going to try and pack as much as we can and uh, and there is a video of the session which uh, you'll be able to view afterwards to be able to refresh on anything if we've skipped over it quite quickly. Um, just a bit of a disclaimer, um, because of the specialised um, software that we use at Law, we don't actually tend to use Office 365 ourselves. We have to, um, to be using some of the desktop versions of the Office software to be able to do what we need to. So, what we've um, we've done is really sort of um, started experimenting with Office 365, so we can understand how some of our customers are using it and, and what sort of opportunities there are there. And and in part of doing that, we've got quite excited about what's possible and how we could use it ourselves. But for now, what we've um, we're showing you is something that Hayden and I have really just sort of knocked up. Um, I'm really grateful for the assistance he's given me and sort of me coming up with ideas around what I think would be useful and him being able to turn it quickly into something that's working. So I would say this is more like a, um, you know, seeing the outcome of a two-person hackathon rather than something that's an actual in-use live system. Um, if we start with, uh, with sort of what is Office 365 and, um, and SharePoint, um, the screen here gives you a bit of an indication of the wide range of, of things which um, sort of form part of the suite. But, Hey, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the, the key tools that are in here that people would either know about or maybe should know about? Sure. Thanks, Jean. Um, well, I guess the big reason most people went to Office 365 was email. <clears throat> so it's very rare for someone to be in Office 365 without having rid of their emails in there. So that's the other part of this. Um, pretty much, uh, yeah, everyone seems to be able to remember what their email address is and what their password is for their email. So that's always a big battle with any IT sort of system. Because you've got that single sign-on across all of the um, Office 365 apps, you can Microsoft has slowly started pulling all of their other, well, some of their other systems into, say, Office 365. Uh, so, for example, SharePoint is one of the ones that is in there. You can't turn that off. So, if you've got Office 365, SharePoint is there. You've got to sit in there. Um, so that's quite amazing for a really small company because it used to be that you had to have your own servers to run SharePoint. And you know, it was licensing costs quite extensive for that. It might be say 10 or 20 grand a year, depending on how many servers you had to run it. So that's quite expensive. But with the Office 365 plan, straight away, you know, you got access to all the software straight away for you know, 30, 10 to 30 dollars a month, which is you know, really reasonable. And then they've brought in um, many, many other tools. So I guess um, it's probably not worth going through more, but some of the more um, Popular ones will be the Power Automate, um, which allows you to do workflows um, from any any of the Office 365 apps and you know many hundreds of connectors. Um, and then Power Apps is becoming more and more popular. A lot of our work is just building Power Apps for people now. So that's um, sort of supercharged forms for um, internal processes. Kind of anything if you've got an access database running around anywhere, it could be rebuilt in Power Apps. Um, if you've heard of InfoPath, a lot of those forms are getting pulled into Power Apps now. Um, Stream's a good one. That's like uh, YouTube for your organisation. The big uh, benefit of that is that it actually goes through and uses AI to transcribe everything in the meeting. So uh, after this, we'll, we could probably upload this video to Stream and it'll actually transcribe everything we said um, throughout the meeting and the, the video, which is good because then when you're searching later using something like Delve, 
basically has will pop up seamlessly. Um, and then obviously Teams is another one that's getting a lot of traction at the moment. So Skype for Business is, is no longer, it's going to be you know, pulled into Teams and that's a great place to have your meetings, but, uh, but also at least you store documents and lists and all sorts of other things within Teams as well. So yeah, there's a lot going on in this Office 365 suite. Um, Kaisala is another one that's interesting, it's sort of like WhatsApp for um, Office 365. So you, know, you don't need an Office 365 account to join up with your company's Kaisada. You just need a mobile phone. You can sign up that way. And then you can pull data from Kaisala into these other suites, which mm. is um, a big part of uh, you know, the modern workplace. Cool, and one other one we were just talking about before was that My Analytics as well, which is kind of um, designed to help you to understand your productivity or, or work habits and whether you're even working too hard as well. So um, you know, there's, there's like a massive range of things you can do. Yeah, because everything that you do in, in Office 365 is pulled into the Microsoft Graph, so it can then be, be um, you know, you can pull on Power BI, another one where you can actually pull all that stuff together from all those different systems and um, create dashboards based on that data. Yeah, it's a really big thing, isn't it, to be able to take the, all the information and then display it in ways that make sense. Yeah. And on the um, on the team side of things, like that's why you, know, you use it regularly for your video calls now. Um, it can be chat, calendar, you know, sort of managing all that sort of stuff, uh, file management. There's, like it's potentially quite a powerful sort of tool in its own right, isn't it, in terms of what people are using it for? Absolutely, yeah. And there's a lot of traction with teams that seems to have um, uh, you know, been adopted very quickly by people. Um, cool, okay, but if we're going to focus more for, for this purpose on SharePoint, which is what we've got up here. Um, and I think from um, from what I can see, SharePoint's like a really useful, flexible tool that you can use for almost sort of anything you can think of. And and particularly for some of the in-house legal teams, I think there's the scope where you're not necessarily going to be able to get some of the more specialised software that certainly the law firms have or that uh, yeah, the other coming onto the market for in-house teams. But if you can understand what's possible out of um, SharePoint and you're already paying basically for all that functionality, then it starts to be quite a useful option, at least in terms of sort of getting yourself started really quickly with some stuff that you'd be surprised probably at how much you can actually do. And, um, and even for the um, law firms out there, perhaps understanding how your clients might be using Office 365 opens up opportunities for you to help them or to collaborate more with them. But do, do you want to talk a little bit about like the, the background with SharePoint and why people have sort of perhaps had a negative experience with it, or sort of, yeah, like when someone's going to talk to people about SharePoint, they, they kind of, yeah, like they've, they've I, I don't see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess, well, the, I think part of um, Office 365 is meant that it is standardised now, so we can't change a whole bunch of these settings that are in the back of SharePoint. Microsoft control that and look after that, which is great, you know, you get your IT team to do it, you know, you'd have to get a specialist and actually make sure the server's running. Um, I mean, I've, I've been doing this for 10 years now, and you go and see different companies, and if they've got an on-premise environment, it's been set up often quite differently depending on, you know, who set it up and how it's been working. The, one of the worst examples I ever saw was a company that had 600 employees, and they hadn't even turned search on a chip. So they were using, you know, a huge chunk of the functionality wasn't even being used because they whoever set it up didn't bother to turn the search function on. So you can't do that with... Office 365 because it automatically works and it mm -hmm. never breaks down and if it does work, so fix it, you know, it happens quite quickly. Um, so I, I think that's part of the issue is with it, you know, it would cost a lot of money to install it, but people would come in and that money would just be spent, spent getting those servers up and running, all the patches done, and then having it sitting there ready to go without anyone putting any thought into how you actually want to use the sites at all. So I think that's, you know, very little user training was given. Mm -hmm. um, great thing about Office 365 is it's, you know, it's one of the maybe top 10 social networks there you know, in the world almost now, the number of users, a few hundred million users. So anything you can think of with an Office 365, you can Google, Google it, you'll find a video or a you know, how-to document on how to do it. So that standardisation has really become really useful. Um, even with the arcade and stuff that I find myself doing sometimes, there's always an answer on the internet for mm -hmm. any problem that comes up. And the other thing that seems to, I think, perhaps give people challenges is it is really easy to get started, from my experience recently, playing around with things. You can create pages, you can you can do things, but 
it's not actually that structured either in the sense that you can go off and start to create something that's a bit sprawling and like you might do similar things in quite different ways depending on like what day of the week it is for. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is quite clever around what Hayden's done and the stuff we've been working on is kind of creating templates for, for being able to do things that you need to be able to do but um, doing them in a more automatic and standardised way. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, like, you know, that concept or how you approach that before we jump in and show some examples? Ooh, yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, so you can do whatever you want with SharePoint and that's, you know, that's built for, you know, Toyota and the US military and, you know, law firms and everyone in the world. So it's, you know, it's just a, it's a standard set of tools that um, you know, are consistent for every sort of industry. And because of that, that it's not quite, you know, you have to customise it a little bit after, after getting it to, you know, hone it perhaps more towards the way you want it. And the best way to do that is typically I've found is to use things like content types and templates because then, um, you know, if you're using uh, a matter template, you just have to update, you know, the content type to have an additional column be put into each of those lists. So if, if you've got three or four lists or matters, it doesn't matter. But once you get a couple of hundred, you, really, you don't want to be adding an individual mm. column into each one of those lists. So using these simple things like um, when SharePoint content types in the templates, and even on larger sites, you start to use PowerShell to up and make updates across the whole site. Um, if you know that everything's built in the exact same consistent manner, you can actually do that rather than going through by hand and having to open up 100 Blair browser windows into a repetitive stuff like that. So, yeah, so that's where the benefit of, you know, getting someone like myself in would be that, you know, I can help you build the template and then maintain that scale. That's definitely what I would say is probably one of the key takeaways from this session would be is that for me, kind of not knowing necessarily what's possible We've sort of started by sort of, oh, could we do this? And then as we've sort of like you know, evolved to thinking or I've come up with sort of an extension of what that would involve, being able to sort of manage that more at the template level rather than having to go through and update every page, you can see how that would really start to make a big difference as you started to scale it. And so knowing so how you can build some of those structures probably means that later on you end up sort of with a much more stable, scalable system that can do all the things you wanted to. So mm -hmm. that was just something I was keen to um, to bring up. But maybe what we should do now is um, is get out of the sort of more technical description stuff and just show some examples of the sort of stuff that um, that I think um, LAM and house legal teams could use it for. And the first thing we've got here is basically like a sort of a, a news page you can see. And and this could be sort of an example of maybe like the, the sort of the hub that the you know the team itself could work out of and you know, it could be the main internet page, if you like, where people come to at the beginning of the day and they can see the latest news. Um, this is all sort of templated on it. It's got sort of a, um, get rid of that. Someone else goes. Um, uh, so um, it's all sort of, um, the, the layout is actually just a template and so you can really quickly sort of, you know, change it around and, and refresh it. You can have news sort of things or, yeah, um, yeah, knowledge sharing that sort of stuff so um, quite simple to be able to um, to build something like this which is just kind of like yeah where people might land and then quickly be able to navigate um, through um, for knowledge management you can see we've sort of just got these tabs along the, um, the top here for easy navigation there's all sorts of things that uh, in terms of yeah like what a legal team would would sit on that might be currently quite hard to, to find and so you know, you could start to gather up things like your guides and know-how, for example, and as you write those, just make them available through a sort of a hub and um, and then create pages for um, for the storage and display of information. So these might be internal team resources that, um, you know, just amongst yourselves, how you, how you like to work, or you might write these types of things for people out in the wider business for what you want them to know about that stuff. Um, opinions, oh, we haven't got anything um, you know, showing in here, but uh, you know, as an opinions register, you could easily start to sort of store all of that stuff that um, that's coming in from the law firms, and we can talk afterwards about how powerful the search is. But um, but you know, all of that information could be available just by doing a really simple search and filtering. Um, you could keep your precedents. Um, you know, could all be stored into the, um, into the document and easily maintained and updated and, and categorised. Um, so, you know, again, this just a simple, easy way to be able to um, to store all that stuff, which might currently be on the um, on the shared drive. Um, 
and then training, you know, if you're doing your own internal training or training for the business, again, you can start to sort of look at how you could um, could provide that stuff. And, you know, here's an example of a, um, an embedded video um, we've done for something for law for wills and powers of attorney, but you could start to sort of you know, embed whether it's PowerPoint or, um, or videos or whatever other resources. And so it just becomes a one-stop shop for all of your knowledge management. Um, <coughs> And well, everything that gets put in the SharePoint gets crawled by the search engine and you can find it when you look at the stuff. So that's all there, unless you don't want people to find it and then you can <laughs> stop that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the really interesting things for me in, in looking at um, yeah, sort of how you can use SharePoint has been thinking about how you would then perhaps manage, uh, manage matters and, um, and sort of be able to structure that up. And so um, here's an example of how you could perhaps decide on all the different types of matters that might be most relevant for your particular area. You could have your most recent matters sort of you know, displaying down here. But, um, but every time you create a matter uh, with stuff that happens down in the background, you can kind of like set it up so that you could have different folders that could automatically be created that would enable you to sort of then capture your correspondence separately from your draft documents, from your final documents, from you know, maybe in a litigation sense, you might have other folders. And so this is where that sort of templating things come in. And that you can sort of kind of set this up so that whatever structure you want to, to save and in, in your information in could happen automatically. And so if I wanted to create a, um, a new matter for, um, for, um, for a project, I could just click a button, come up to, uh, to here, choose to do another matter. You know, choose which of the categories that we're uh, we're looking at, and save the matter. And then in the background, I think this is where Power Automate is kicking in. So it's sort of going around and, and, and creating some of these things um, yeah, in a more automatic way, so the users don't have to, etc. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so Power Automate um, goes through, gets the ID of the template, grabs that template, um, shortens the URL of what you've typed in there, and then creates the the item based upon that and then updates the default values of the document library columns so that we can crawl them later to search. Cool. So that's just all power automate just goes through and just and it's almost instantaneous, isn't it? Yeah, it's, no, it's really fast. That's, that's really quite neat. So we'll come back and look at that matter that we created shortly. Mm. Uh, another um, another possible um, idea would be just the use of SharePoint as a, a basic form of a um, contracts database. And so um, here's an example of um, an NDA um, list of, of all of the NDAs that have been uh, been generated, and um, and all of the sort of fields that um, that go into the document have been turned into uh, into columns that be, uh, could be completed, and so you can work your way through and, and sort of again run filters and sort of searches to see you know which NDAs we've got, whether they've got expiry dates on them, what those dates are, which parties are dealing with, what countries they're from, whatever information be relevant. And, um, and so the example we'll show shortly is how we'll use a, an, an online form to generate the NDA, but take the data out of that form and actually populate it into this list in the same, uh, at the same time, and also run some approvals mechanisms as well to be able to show how that all works. So let's come back to this list shortly in terms of how that, uh, that might work. Um, and then the, the last thing, I suppose, in terms of the, the, these topics along the top, apart from the search, is just whether you can then sort of create maybe a self-service portal or a sort of a legal gateway type concept for, uh, for people that are wanting to work with the legal team to be able to come in and to be able to, um, to do what they, um, they need to do. So um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll do an example with an NDA in a minute, make your own NDA. But just as sort of yeah, some of the other things, for example, you could have a form here that may enable people to request new corporate delegations, for instance. And um, and so with a little bit of information, I won't get through the whole thing here. Um, but you could choose someone, um, yeah, delegation, and details there. And you can have a very nice dynamic sort of form, which is um, perhaps currently this is all managed in Excel, 
And so for somebody to actually go through this and figure out like what are the categories that I should even be thinking about and then within those categories, what types of things can I do and at what levels, you could replace that with something that's nice and intuitive. You only see the fields for this options that you select and when you then open them up, you can choose that I want this type of a DFA and this could be then providing, displaying information around what those amounts actually are. They can put in the amount that they want. They can confirm that they understand this is within the limit and they could add as many of those as they would like. And then that could all be emailed automatically to somebody who's then able to basically say, well, it must be sort of done within the framework that we want it to be done and it's compliant and so I can now action that without a whole lot of emails going back and forth saying like you've asked for a delegation in a category that's not relevant and you've asked for too much and all that sort of stuff. So, so something like that could be um, could be quite useful or um, or it could just be you've got a, like a general matter intake form and um, and so instead of getting again really unstructured information coming in you know, by phone or email and sort of never really being able to explain the value you're adding, um, yeah, people could um, could give you what you need in a more structured form so you can start to gather like the instructions coming from which business units, you know, what, what you need, uh, what they need from you, if there are other parties involved, you know, like you can gather up those details, um, you know, the due dates that are in it, if there's anything they can provide as an upload that, you know, would help you to get up to speed. So it doesn't necessarily need to replace all that sort of, um, yeah, the, the more conversation and understanding and, and you know, being a business partner, but just streamlining it, but also gathering up information in a more structured way so you can then start to sort of run some analytics around what that legal function looks like and the value you're adding. So in the back of the results for this form, you could actually keep some other information around how you've assessed this as to whether it's high value or low value, um, you know, where it sits in sort of in the framework that you want to use when you're assessing where you should be focusing resources. So um, I think that this type of thing could be, um, you know, again quite um, quite easily used and these forms can just be embedded into, um, into pages on SharePoint really easily to make it quite a simple thing to be able to do but what we'll do, um, do now is just to, to show an example of perhaps a more integrated workflow and the one we've chosen to do is NDAs because it seems to be something that's perhaps more more interesting to um, in-house legal teams or, or a nice place to be able to start with something which is clearly regarded as being lower value in terms of the legal work, ideally could be done on a self-serve basis. You may or may not want to have sort of legal visibility and oversight of um, what's going on, but at the moment, probably a lot of these things are being entered into without anybody really having any idea about what's, um, what's going on. So the idea is if, um, if you could create this type of a form, um, and this is actually an example of something which is not a, a core Microsoft Office 365 product, but it's been integrated with Office 365, so you can basically use it. Um, so, um, so this form can be used, um, and you can then get the, the information sent through. You can run some approvals. You can get digital signing, and the documents can be saved and stored back into, into SharePoint. So we'll just go through an example and, and show how it could work. So. First, I'll, uh, I'll put an email address to where we want our document to be returned to. Let's copy my address. And what type of party we're dealing with. So it's the SharePoint agency. You can display, um, you know, sort of guidance and, and um, other helpful information um, to the users as well, if that's going to be helpful for them. Uh, this one here is a slightly interesting section in that you've got your general purposes that um, the disclosures could be made for, but just for the purpose of demonstration, um, I've said it so that if we choose some other purpose that needs to be, um, you know, to be entered in, that might be something where the legal team says, all right, we would like to be involved in, um, yeah, in understanding that. And we can enter as many other purposes as we like. Um, the form's really nice, you can move things up and down and uh, move it around. Um, you can build in some sort of acknowledgements that you know, yeah, they have to sort of you know, say they understand that they need to do certain things in certain ways if, if that's helpful. So you can embed business rules and compliance into um, into the process, but in a way that doesn't really slow them down as long as they um, you know, they they follow the approach they should be doing. And then we've added some fields in here, which is really just for the purposes of the uh, the digital signing aspect. So um, myself as a secretary here. 
the Hayden signing on this side. I'm going to use the same email address for all of these, so it's going to make my inbox quite busy. But um, so I can um, I can save any of this if you know, as I want to go submit, uh, and that will then complete this part of the um, of the process. So as a user, I get a bit of a summary saying thanks. Yeah, here's all the information that you've entered. So I can sort of check off what I've um, what I've done. But I'm also going to get an email that's going to um, to tell me what to do next. So if I come up to my inbox. You can see there'll be a few emails will start to come in through here. So uh, <coughs> let's see what we've got. The first one is, um, is an, <coughs> an email that's come through saying, um, uh, thanks for filling in the information, but basically you've entered something with this other type of purpose that needs a legal approval. So that's been sent off for, uh, for them to check. So please just wait until you, um, you hear back from them. Uh, this one's actually got the, um, the, the email that comes from this form saying, hey, here's the agreement you just needed the details for. And so um, we could control whether that's a PDF or a Word format. We've just got both of them sitting there for now just um, out of interest. Yeah, uh, all your fields are populated in the document directly, aren't they? They are, yeah. So we've actually generated a document with all that information in there. Uh, this is an email like the, the legal team might receive if they wanted some visibility about what was happening. So you could get something saying, hey, look, good news, somebody's filled in the form, uh, this is what they've entered. You can come in here and you can manage and edit that entry if you wanted to. So um, if there was any need to, you could regenerate the, um, the, yeah, the PDF that the user might have got, the legal team could get a Word version. And, uh, and up here we've got an email that's come through to uh, the legal team in this case saying, you know, somebody in the business is trying to do something which needs an approval, and um, so do you approve or reject it? And so if I was to, actually firstly I'll, I'll come up to the, um, uh, deal with me a second, um, the NDA uh, section of that list, and we've actually got this entry here has, um, has come through with the, um, the initial details from that entry, but we can see at the moment there's nothing in there around legal approval or legal comment. So, um, so we'll just come back to that one in a second. Because if I wanted to approve this, I can say this is fine. Put a comment in there and submit that. In the background, this is all being controlled by um, Microsoft or Power Apps, as it's called. Power Automate. Power uh, Automate, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 And so, um, so there's a, a, a sort of structured workflow that happens here. So immediately after I've approved that, um, as a user, I get the email saying, you, you know, this is all approved. You've got this um, this email back. And so this is all pretty rudimentary. The styling could be improved, but this is the basic sort of functionality that could be used. And uh, and so then if you come back up to the, um, the NDA list, and you can see that automatically then populates. So you could have a, a, a right up to date record of all of the sort of yeah, the, the transactions that are going on in different types of categories if that was something that you wanted to do. Um, so we've got our um, got our, um, our documents here and one other thing that I can now do is I could look to to save um, the email and the, um, the documents back into SharePoint. And so there's another little sort of add-on here that we've got uh, which enables us to be done really simply. So if I click on this one place email which we just downloaded and I can choose to save my email and these attachments and I can show my locations that are available and choose out of my methods here. It's gone there. That's the wrong. It might be the I'm not sure. Sorry, I've I've got something sitting over the top of my screen here as well. Let's try that again. All right. Just controlling the wrong buttons here. So I'll try that one more time. Yes. Here we go. Um, and I can come down to my projects, and I've got the, the new webinar one there, but we'll go into this um, previous project that we set up, and I can save these into my draft folder, and just choose save there. And I think I can just click finish on that, and get back to work. So if I then come back into SharePoint, 
and I'll come to my methods. And I'll come down to the project. And I'll look in my draft documents. And so I can see there that I've got my um, my three documents and, or two documents and the email there. And one of the cool things is in the Office 365 suite is I can then open up the um, the document if I wanted to um, yeah, to be sharing and collaborating with people on this. Very simple to just come up here to the the share functionality, and I can choose someone that I want to to share that with. So if I want to, I can um, collaborate with Hayden by sending a link off to him and he would then be able to, to see the same document and work on it. So some of that sort of attaching documents to emails and then firing them out and then you know working out later on that someone's been working on one version and mm -hmm. someone on another can go away. It's, it's worth pointing out, Gene, too, that if you allow external sharing that person to be another person outside of your organisation too. That's cool. Um, and so one little thing here, we've we've so sort of put these little smart tags into the um, into the document in each place where someone will need to sign, and the aim there is just to make it easy to then sort of look at how you could um, avoid having to to print this document out and then um, sign it, scan it, attach it to an email, send it to somebody else, um, chase them up seven times to ask them if they're going to sign it, and then wait for them to send you a counterpart back that you need to to, to muck around with. So. If we um, if we were to come down and um, say that's actually now a final version, I'm happy with um, yeah, with that. I could uh, move move that into my so I guess my Zoom meeting seems really blocking me. Um, yeah, where do I? Uh, yeah, you're on the right track. See how we were not pretty one. That one then? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Final. Move it to there, and so I'll come into my final folder. I've got my document, and I want to send that off for digital signing. So there's another um, third-party application that can add in here for secure signing, which is a New Zealand um, digital signing company. And so if I open up the options here, I can say I want to send this document off for signature. And so there's an integration between Office 365 and Secured Signing that will then take care of a lot of the, uh, the work involved in being able to do this as well. So I'm going to use the Smart Tag functionality that, um, that they have. And so what that will do is it's going to read the, um, the document that we've got in there and it's going to see that Gene needs to sign and Hayden needs to sign and here's the email address. It's got the you know, um, same email address for both of them. If I wanted to, I could turn on you know, functionality around using mobile phones as well, but I'll turn that off and um, and I can just send this out for signing. I can set a due date and that'll control how often reminders will automatically be sent out if required. And let's close that. Um, so I'll come back into my email. And so I've got two attachments that have come in here. Um, we've got one for um, for me, I can get the um, code. There's just a little code that's required. It's all you don't need an account or anything to be able to sign. You just need to know what the uh, what the code is. Find that out. <clears throat> There's some quite cool functionality in the digital signing, uh, which enables you to to uh, make a user actually review the document before they uh, before they can sign it, and so they actually have to to scroll all the way through the document. And have spent at least some minimum period of time in doing that before they could sign, and that might help later on that they can't argue they didn't know what they were signing. Uh, and so that will now take me just down to where that smart tag was, and so I just have to click on there, enter my job description, and I can sign. So that's one down, and I can do the same thing for the other person. This could all be happening in parallel, of course. It was two nine oh one. We'll do the same thing there. Wait a couple more seconds. Choose a signature type, and it's done. 
So if I come back into uh, here, we can see that Hayden, that each signatory basically will get um, an email automatically. So like that whole process of having to prepare like a, a, a um, counterparts, sort of a, you know, like complete version um, and rescan it and then resend it out to everybody just disappears because each person that's signing will get an email with a confirmation that here's the, the agreement with, uh, which has all of the, uh, the signatures in it. So that just takes away one of those, um, those annoying things that you would have to um, otherwise do. Um, uh, I got one as well. If you look in the email, you can actually see you've got this awesome audit trail as well. Like every step in the process is all set out. So yeah, um, yeah you've got that full verification, I suppose, of exactly who did what and when in the signing process, which again will help with sort of if there's ever any disputes about who signed what, when, or how, or why, all that stuff. But if I um, if I come back into um, SharePoint again, sorry, where's my um i'll go up to matters i'll come back into here in our final document section you actually automatically get the, the document that um, that was signed, um, because it was launched out of here, it also returns into here. So um, from that sort of perspective about making sure that you don't lose copies of documents that have been entered into, um, that can all be sorted as well. There's actually some other stuff that you can do in the signing system, which is pretty neat in terms of specifying like another SharePoint location where all contracts could go back to, or an email address that all contracts would go back to as well. So. That's again sort of more outside of the Office 365 sort of things, but um, so that's that, that's the, the the core functionality there. The other thing to, to touch on is the uh, the search actually, isn't it, Hayden? In terms of like um, the ability to search across this whole kind of um, uh, whole area, so that, that's really powerful from what I can see in terms of your ability to to go across as much content as people are enabled to be able to search and. We were just looking before at a, a case um, with telecom and um, the name was Nutter. And so um, out of those 32,919 results, we can sort of filter that down to, you know, to four results there that would be applicable. But you've got um, some, I think, out of the box type um, functionality in terms of the, um, you know, the, the document types that you might, um, might search on. And so you can filter down on, on that, or what else have we got? Creation date, size of file. But you've done some other stuff in there as well, Hayden. Yeah, so that'll be out of the box ones, as you say, and that's just your metadata getting pulled into the search engine and you can filter on those. But we've created our own ones called topic and subject. So if you click on those down there, so that's all our custom ones there. So every document that gets put into that knowledge management site gets tagged with knowledge management. Now that doesn't happen out of the box, unbelievably. You think that <laughs> they would actually say, well, this is the site name, this is the document library, make it available in the search engine, but they don't. So um, a lot of those default values that I'm setting, the only reason you really do that is so you can use these filters here. Now, when you've got a couple of hundred documents, not an issue, but 600,000 documents or a million documents, you want to be able to perhaps filter as much as you can um, to help find what you're after. Mm. Cool. OK, so we're almost, uh, almost through sort of the, um, I guess, the, the core part of the, um, the presentation. I think the other thing we were going to just have a, a brief look at was, actually not that one, uh, the, the what's the name? It was the Power Automate and, um, and sort of what's happening there. So there's, uh, there's a couple of things to, um, to look at. One is just the, um, the flows that, um, that are applicable. So, if you're interested in the um, yeah, the flow that sits in behind the um, uh, what we did with the NDAs, you can sort of see it. It's basically just maps out into a nice little flow chart where you get an entry in the form, which means you can create the item in SharePoint and you map the fields. Uh, but you can put conditions in. So if the um, there is another permitted purpose uh, for the NDA, then you could go down this chart, which would then have that approval flow in it. Or if no, you would go down here. And then if the approval was either given or not, you can have different emails that could be sent out. So there's no nothing particularly 
like rocket science about that, but it's just a case of thinking how would you logically want some of these workflows to uh, to work. And with flows as well, you, you can just do really short flows. So like if there was a workplace accident involving an injury, send an SMS to mm -hmm. these six people. So you can get quite, you know, quite specific with what you want. And then the only other thing I um, thought might be interesting to mention is just that within the whole Office 365 suite, um, it seems to be sort of more and more potential for sort of, um, you know, like the, uh, the use of organisational data uh, and they've got sort of a lot of, um, I guess, you know, capability within Microsoft around AI. And, and while there's a lot of talk in the legal space about AI and, and what may or may not be coming and, and that sort of stuff, and it seems to me like there's a whole bunch of stuff that you're going to be able to start accessing within Office 365, which they're going to enable in a sort of a more simple, intuitive way that you'll be able to start adding some stuff. And maybe you talk a little bit about the, you know, some of that uh, extraction of information. Mm. Exactly. So, um, so here we've got AI Builder, which is their sort of um, uh, nice, easy user interface way to get into their cognitive services and the other um, Azure-based um, artificial intelligence stuff that's happening. So that they've got the real hardcore stuff where you have to know your coding and you set up your own server and do all this sort of stuff to do it that way. But then they're pulling in the real, the more basic or the more popular features of that and making it easier for end users like ourselves to actually come in. Take advantage of those sort of systems. So, um, yeah, you know, it's just going leaps, leaps and bounds. This sort of stuff. There's all sorts. You know, we can do facial recognition now in Power Apps. Um, you know, signing and all sorts of things that were, you know, of three or four years ago, were hard to believe you'd be able to even do it alone with a consumer Office 365 account. So I think one of the examples you gave was just like extracting key information across a whole range of, you know, like uh, documents or information to be able to pull out what are the main concepts and almost sort of yeah, map, like what are those main things that are in there? So you know, that would be relevant for discovery or official information at requests or that type of thing, wouldn't it, in terms of just being able to find yeah, stuff? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, technically you can paste in, say, 10 or 20 paragraphs of content and then click a button, um, the app will upload that to Microsoft Cognitive Services and then it returns back the 20 keywords or post keywords, a couple hundred post keywords, and then you can, you know, add them to the, the metadata for your, your SharePoint list or whatever you need to do from there. Yeah. Cool. So all stuff that, is, you know, people just don't do. So if we were uploading a document, we can tag it in SharePoint, but nobody you know, mm. they often don't get around to it. But if you've got you know, that next step where it makes it easy and you tick a couple of boxes, then that might encourage people to tag this. Yeah. And then probably the last thing was just in terms of like the, the out of the box connectors for third party products that go into um, Office 365. Mm. It's just a, like a really rapidly increasing list of things. And then so I'll, I'll just show on the screen here if we sort of scroll down. These are all like existing connectors that you can sort of, you know, um, already sort of link these products or you know, parts of these products up into the, um, the Power Automate so you can you know, can do things with you know um, whatever the, these other products are mm. um, and sort of automatically do things so you know like go to meetings and um, intercom and LinkedIn and yeah, whatever so yeah, it just seems to me to be so much opportunity to not only get everything that Microsoft has built but there's this whole community of kind of um, software providers out there that are also wanting to be part of it and so they're going out of their way to build more and more integrations of what they do into Office 365 as well. Exactly. So, you know, with that Twitter feed, for example, <laughs> you can create a power app that goes through and pulls every Twitter feed with your company's hashtag in it and pull it onto a screen and then you can click a button to send that to a shared window so it's always tracked. Yeah. yeah, just one example of something you could possibly do. So, yeah, you can use the data in uh, all sorts of different of products, Power Automate, Power Apps, Power BI, all those sort of things and pull it all together. Cool. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we track it up and see if there's any questions? Not really, I think, yeah. I mean, it's a thing, I, I guess the um, Microsoft are investing a gigantic amount of money into this. Um, every day, every week, there's a, an email that comes out with the 20 different changes that they're notifying you about. Um, and improvements every week. It gets better to, and easier to use. It's more functionality gets built into that platform. It's yeah, it's gigantic, and it's quite an exciting area to be working in. Great. Um, so, Christine, that's pretty much it for for us um, to this point. Um,
Is there any questions or how would you like to go from now? Yep, so there looks like there's one question in the question and answer box. Do you want me just to read it out to you? Oh, yeah. Um, I can see that there is a self-service portal. Is there a link from your website? Um, I'm not sure you mean in terms of like law or within this portal. The, the way we've sort of thought of it is that you would have this just within your own environment so that you would only make it available to the people that you wanted to have available um, to them. So within Office 365, you'd be able to control all the permissions in terms of who can see what. And so if you wanted there to be a form for, for people you, know, you could control down to a page by page level which pages and which sort of options were available to which people, if that answers the question. Yeah, and then um, each template might be slightly different for each organisation as well. So I guess. Um, they're a little bit bespoke, but the first step, I guess, we perhaps get in touch with your good self, and yeah, if you've got specific needs in mind. Yeah, I think that's really very much the case of sort of um, just trying to understand what your current process looks like, what you'd ideally like it to look like. Um, there'll be opportunities to improve it as you go, and, and sort of yeah, refine from there. And so that's um, that's the, seems to be the beauty of this Office 365 is that you can kind of like imagine what you'd like and then find ways to be able to do it. Um, I see some other questions have come in. So okay. is secure signing a feature of SharePoint or 365 or a separate add-on at a separate cost? Um, so it does come at, a, um, at an extra cost, but um, but that extra cost can be um, as low as 10 bucks a month in terms of that's the plan that I, that I use it on, which gives me 10 documents to sign a month. And then if I go above that, I pay like $1.30 or something extra. So um, I think digital signing is probably like one of the highest return on investment things that you could possibly do, given it costs so little, it just takes hours of boring admin time out of process and means that you're reducing all of your risk of losing things. And uh, and it's very scalable. So, you know, the, there's enterprise plans and there's other ways you can do it, but you can start really, really small with a few people um, just doing as many documents as makes sense. Uh, have you found document generation tools for populating contracts which integrate well within the flow environment? Um, yes, as the answer. So the, um, the, the form builder that we're using uh, is a product called Cognito Forms, but there's lots and lots of um, you know, other form builders out there, but we, we use that one because we found it's actually very effective for being able to, to generate even quite complex documents. And um, you know, we can do like have a short form and a long form consulting agreement, for instance, and, and using the form, we can control which version will assemble based off the, the logic and, and sort of, yeah, like the contract amount or the complexity uh, that uh, that's used. So yeah, I think that, um, again, that's one of the things I like about what the, um, the Office 365 seems to, to cover is you can find lots of different tools that will work for whatever circumstance you want and you might need something really, really grunty or you might need something that's actually at the simpler end, but there's lots of options. Yeah, and in the last, say, six months now, it's become incredibly easy to use Microsoft Word to populate those things as well. So if you've got more of a simple form, then you can use a SharePoint list to populate a Word template using Flow. So yeah. there's lots of, there's a few different ways now, isn't there? Cool. Um, did you want to look at the next one that's coming there about the agreement database? <laughs> right. Within Office 365, is there an agreement database function that can be set up to alert parties when a contract is close to expiring? Yeah, so again, that would be something where you'd use Microsoft uh, Power Automate not Microsoft Flow, um, to um, you'd create a Flow and Power Automate, I think would be the terminology to do that. And you can do, um, within Flow, uh, check every day to see if something's happened. So you have a status column um, for that document and then expiry date is expiry date today minus seven, yes, no, has it been signed, yes, no, send email. Yeah. 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 So I think if you've got the data, and, and that's one of the really cool things about the um, using the um, the digital way of creating some of the content, the, yeah, the contracts is that every question that you enter you know, the information for, instead of just going through like a word template and finding some square brackets and typing information, then you're not really doing anything other than creating a word document there. But if you're using a digital form to be able to capture the information, you can then not only generate the document, but you can actually create the data which you can then use to make business decisions on. 
And that's what's really going to drive like a business outcome for you is that you know, kind of all of those contracts actually become more living things where mm. you know, actions can automatically occur based around some of that. And then you build time into that. So, you're, okay, that might not be that exciting for the first three months, but after 10 years of getting that information together, you'll be able to see trends that are happening over that, that period of time. Why are we having more NDAs at this time or you know, more different things like that? And they might pop up, you know, Absolutely, I think the, um, just even for the um, the the, you know, the random range of questions that's, that comes into the legal team at the moment, I think if you start to gather some more structured insights into like you know where are those questions coming from and are they all relating to the same types of issue, um, yeah, then maybe that helps you to work out where you might focus some of your training or where there might be some of those sort of you know, the risk areas that need to be focused on. So and areas to automate. So yeah. 50% of your inquiries are NDAs and you haven't quite worked that out yet because you know, you're not getting a massive amount, but you say, well, let's automate that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so I think that's right. It's sort of information in, um, in a much more usable way. Um, so the, um, the the question was around um, how do we spell the form that we use? So the form that was demonstrated and there is Cognito forms. Um, there's other forms that sort of, like Microsoft have their own form as well, which I think is yeah. improving. I use Power Apps. Because um, it's not built into the Office 365 platform, but there are many other forms. There's Microsoft Forms as well, which is similar to Cognito, nowhere near as powerful, but it's a let you put a, pub, a form on a public facing website, which is kind of useful. Um, not much in the way of look and feel changes you can do on that, but if you need three columns on a, a Contact Us page, that could be quite handy. A lot of the, um, the reasons why we use a particular tool over another one is really not so much around sort of the actual form, but like what you need to do and the, the back end and how you want that to work. So again, it depends on what you're trying to achieve for like what which would be the right tool to use. Um, question why we decided to use Cognito rather than um, the Microsoft forms. Um, probably two parts to that. One, um, at the time I last looked at Microsoft forms, it couldn't do some of the, the stuff that I'd, um, I knew we could do in Cognito forms. Um, there's another part of it, which is actually a more general applicability, which is we've we've been using Cognito Forms for quite a while now, and we know what we can do with it and what we can't do with it. And so when we're talking to our customers, we like to be able to give them certainty of price and you know, delivery times and how things will work. And so there's definitely an element, I think, of just finding something that works well for you. Um, you could literally spend your whole life looking through all of the different apps that are amongst the, you know, the, um, the add-ons and trying to work out whether one's slightly better than another one or not. But at a certain point, I think it's just better to say, you know, this is one that we find is good for what we need right now. And if later on we decide that we need something different, then we can go looking for, for yeah. that. But the over-analysis, you know, sometimes in terms of all the options, that's a real problem I see in terms of people looking for something that's perfect rather than what can actually do what they need it to right now. And, and maybe that's another reason why SharePoint's been perhaps overlooked so many times and people just thinking that, yeah, like, well, I need I need something something else rather than actually I've got something that's here right now that I could use mm -hmm. that's actually really good. Yeah. And um, and who knows how good we could, could make it. Yeah, so um, Microsoft Forms is great for, you know, contact us pages that know we need the functionality of something like Cognito Forms. Um, Power Apps are now available as portals, which means you can make a Power App as a public facing website. Um, so you, I think over time we might see even more Power Apps getting created that you can embed on your website um, that people can fill in quite complicated um, uh, forms for. So yeah, I don't, Microsoft Forms isn't, um, yeah, look and feel stuff is kind of annoying as well. There's not a great deal of variety in the way that you can structure the questions, and each question has to start with one, two, three, four, five, and you can't turn that off. So it's a very basic tool. Um, just following up on what Hayden just mentioned, though, actually, you can um, you can use some of the stuff, even yeah, like we we just showed an example within sort of the organisation of how the legal team might create a, a self service thing. But you can use the same concepts even like as part of the wider business. I mean, if the if the business process actually could start or should start with the customer contacting the you know, the, the company saying this is what we want, this service or this outcome, if you can gather that information directly from them, and there's no reason why the forms couldn't be public facing on the external website, you could still then yeah you know, like automate more of that process in a way that's really tightly legally compliant. 
but also takes like a whole bunch of current steps where different people are doing a small part of the overall process and then just copying and pasting or retyping the same information over and over. So yeah, um, you so can start it easy, but then yeah, like actually build out the, the business process. So I've done that with the power company in Auckland. Um, somebody fills in a form on their public facing website and it goes directly to the team that actually does the work and then they complete the form within the Power App. So it's going through, I think we use Jot Forms, which is another form building tool to fire it through to the, um, within Power Apps and flows and emails and stuff go from there. Uh, I think that's it on the questions at the moment. Christine? Yes, thank you for answering all those questions, Jean and Hayden, and for an amazing demonstration. It was really interesting to see how some of the functions of Office 365 work and how SharePoint can be used as a document management and collaboration tool. A huge thank you to all of you who have attended today. On that note, we will draw to a close. As you know, the Centre for Legal Innovation is very much focused on these types of webinars, this type of information sharing, collaboration and experience exchange. We are all about practical solutions. There will be many more webinars coming up in the Legal Techie Tuesday series in 2020. So don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter or Facebook for announcements. We look forward to welcoming you back to one of our events and thank you again very much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone.